All right. I wanted to highlight mannose binding lectin uh, because our favorite process is back. Complement. <laughs> this time we're looking at the lectin binding pathway of complement, um, complement activation. And so it's going to be a, very similar once we get past the initiation um, to what we learned with the alternative pathway. But in the lectin binding pathway, which is still part of the innate immune system because it is nonspecific, and it is initiated by um, mannose binding lectin, which is a cute phase uh, protein produced during an infection. Um, it's going to be just slightly different for the initiation. And then it's going to look very much the same. But mannose binding lectin, again, produced by the liver during infection as an acute phase protein, circulates in the plasma um, with two serine proteases. They're zymogen, so they're not going to be functional. Um, and they're called MASP1 and MASP2. MASP stands for mannose binding lectin associated serine protease. <laughs> okay, so MASP1 and MASP2, and it kind of looks like a stalk of flowers that's upside down. So if you were to flip it around and you were to hold flowers, right, that's kind of what it looks like. And so each of the MASP1 and MASP2, they are going to be associated with the main stalk. When it's bound to the surface of a pathogen, then mannose binding lectin will trigger the lectin binding pathway of complement activation. And then because it can, it's also going to serve as an opsonin. And so there are receptors that can recognize uh, mannose binding lectin and internalize it for phagocytosis. So what happens then when that mannose binding lectin um, comes into contact with the pathogen is one of those molecules of mass 2 is going to be induced to become enzymatically active and just go ahead and cut itself. And then it's going to go ahead and cut the other MASP2. Now, MASP, um, so the substrates then for these activated MASP2 proteases, then are two new complement proteins we haven't talked about, C4 and C2. And they are stand for complement protein 4 and complement protein 2. Now you might be like, oh, this is kind of familiar. Um, pretty similar to what we saw happen with C3 when it got close to the surface of a pathogen, um, kind of spontaneously being hydrolyzed and becoming IC3, right? We, we saw that. And then there was this cleavage then of B into to BB by factor D, right? So C4 is pretty similar to C3 in its structure and its function. And C2 is somewhat similar to what we know as factor B. Okay, so just keep that in mind. We're going to see some similarities. They're just slightly different proteins. So we have this MASP, um, this mannose binding lectin attached to the surface of the pathogen. Okay, so we have our pathogen surface. We have our mannose binding lectin attached. Okay, whatever it's, it's binding to that surface of the pathogen. And then we have our MASPs. Whoops. Our MASP proteins are in here and they're going to then cleave um, and become active serine proteases that are going to act on C4. So C4 will come in, interact with MASP2, which is now an active serine protease, and it will cleave C4, C4B into C4A and B. C4B will bind to the surface of the pathogen, and C4A will go away. Okay, so that pattern is similar to what we've seen um, happen in the past. Uh, then molecule C2 will come in and it will interact with a MASP2, which again are active serine proteases, will cleave C2 into C2A and C2B. And this is the one time that it's gonna be slightly different. C2A now is going to be the protein that stays and interacts with C4B and C2B is going to go away. We can say it goes bye-bye. <laughs> okay, I don't know. Um, so C4A is going to go away and C2B is going to go bye-bye. And C2A then will interact with C4B. 
So then we'll have a C4A or C4B to C2A or C2A um, will then be the um, protein group that will cleave C3. So C3 is still involved. Remember when we looked at that table that showed um, how they all three pathways of complement activation coalesce on the cleavage of C3? This is where it happens. And because C4B, C2A is the molecule that does the cleavage of C3, it is called the C3 convertase. But we call it the classical pathway of um, C3 convertase, the classical C3 convertase. You're like, but why isn't it called the lectin pathway? Because we're gonna find when we learn the classical pathway, this is the same. So in the alternative pathway of complement activation, the C3BBB was the C3 convertase. And now C4B2A, is the C3 convertase of the mannose binding lectin and we'll find of the classical pathway. And so the job of that protein combination is to cleave C3 and it's gonna cleave C3 and it's gonna cleave C3 and it's gonna cleave C3 over and over and over again. Um, C3As will go away, C3Bs will be deposited on the surface of the pathogen, just like what we saw in chapter two with the alternative pathway of complement activation. So again, here is that um, diagram and where we had with the alternative pathway, it was the pathogen surface that um, initiated that first C3 to become hydrolyzed. Um, in the lectin pathway, it's going to be binding of um, mannose binding lectin on the surface of the pathogen. And then eventually when we get to the adaptive immune system, we're going to look at um, antibody, but C-reactive protein can also <laughs> activate the classical pathway of complement activation, which C-reactive protein was an acute phase protein that we saw a couple slides ago. Well, actually in the third or I don't even know what third, right? Or is this the third, the second lecture of this chapter? Okay, so then let's look at C-reactive protein. Because it is an acute phase protein, that we're covering in the innate immune system, but it can initiate the classical pathway of complement activation, much in the same way that mannose binding lectin does. And it looks very, very similar to mannose binding lectin, like an upside down bouquet of flowers. Flip it around, you have a stalk and you have the pathogen binding pieces. And then you have these things called CR1, CR, or CR, C1R, and C1S. C1 is the first complement protein. So finally you're like, oh, now we have the numbers. We have, now we have C1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, and all of them, right? So now we've actually talked about all of the complement proteins. Um, so the stock is made up of C1Q, and then the two zymogens that are going to be the serine proteases are C1R and C1S. And so you can see how they're associated with the stock. C1R and C1S are similar in structure and function to the MASP1 and MASP2. So like you're probably um, assuming is going to happen is we're going to have C-reactive protein is going to interact with a pathogen surface, okay? Um, it's going to bind to the bacterium and it can interact with complement protein one, which will then cause, um, so you'll see here that the the C1Q stock is going to cause C one of those molecules of C1R to cut itself. And then it's going to go ahead and um, cut both of the C1Ss, making them serine proteases, okay? So C1S then becomes a protease that cleaves C4. C4A and C4B will be created. C4B is going to attach to the surface of the pathogen, and C4A is going to go away. C1S also cleaves C2, and then C2 will form into C2A and C2B. C2A will stay, and C2B will go bye-bye. 
that's going to create then the C4 uh, or C3 convertase of the classical pathway, um, which is C4B2A, just like what we saw previously. So here is a diagram showing all of that in one um, place. And we have C-reactive protein that's going to be near the surface of the pathogen. We have C1 um, binding to the surface of C-reactive protein. And then we have C1R cleaving itself, which will then cleave C1S. C1S or C1R will also cleave C4. C1S will cleave C2. And C4A will go away, C2B will go bye-bye, and then we have our C3 convertase of the classical pathway. That means that it will cleave C3 again and again and again and deposit lots of C3B on the surface because the C3As go away, the anaphylatoxins. And we can either have opsonization occur because of all of the C3Bs on the surface, or we can start to bring in C5 through nine to make the membrane attack complex. Whew, I hope that was okay. Um, okay, so that's where we're going to stop with this one. And we will um, pick up with our last lecture here, um, looking at NK cells. <laughs>